His name is Stephen Hussey. He's an MS and a DC. That sounds like a lot of lot of letters, with no vowels, a lot of consonants. MS means Master of Science. DC means Doctor of Chiropractic. Functional medicine practitioner. He attained both of his doctorate and his chiropractic, chiropractic masters in human nutrition and functional medicine from the University of Western States. That's in um, that's in that's in Oregon, if I remember right, Portland, Oregon. At any rate, um, this guy has written a couple of books, and I uh, ran into him over at KetoCon. He was nice enough to hand me one of his books. And um, unfortunately, I've been so busy, I haven't even cracked the book yet. But doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. We have him here today to tell us all about it. The book is um, he's promoting it right now, Understanding the Heart and My Health. Uh, he's it's just called Understanding the Heart. I'm talking about Dr. Stephen Hussey. How are you doing, Steve? Not too bad. How are you? I'm not complaining. Steve, Am I guessing this or do you live somewhere near me? Are you in Virginia? I'm in Virginia. I'm outside of Roanoke, Virginia. Nice area down there. Yeah, I like it. Yeah, I'm a little north of you and um, just moved here a couple of years ago and can't get enough of it. Are you originally from here? No, I'm from North Carolina, um, but I haven't lived in North Carolina in a long time. I've been all over the place and eventually settled here. How do you end up in Portland, a guy that's from the, basically the, the southern east coast? And you ended up at, at Portland University. How, how does that work? Um, I've always been that way, really. I mean, you know, I, I, I went to undergrad close to home in Asheville, North Carolina, and then um, went out to Oregon for chiropractic school, my master's degree. And then my first chiropractic job out of school was actually in Ireland. Uh, so I lived in Ireland for two wow. years um, and then kind of made my way back this way. And I've been in Virginia for a while. So I've kind of always been that way, just kind of looking to, to go out and, and experience and live in new places. So. I mean, that's a big change, Ireland and then Virginia. <laughs> it just doesn't seem like it matches. Yeah. Well, right. Virginia, is, it reminds me of home a little bit. Uh, like the Roanoke area reminds me of Asheville a little bit as far as like similar size town in the mountains um, with a lake nearby. So, so it uh, kind of reminds me of that. Well, you know, Asheville is one of those towns we considered moving to. Mm -hmm. my, my question is, why didn't you go back there? Um. I, uh, I, when I came, when I was coming back from Ireland, actually coming back from Ireland is a funny story, but, um, when I was coming back, uh, I was looking for jobs, uh, because I needed a job. I was actually getting somewhat kicked out of Ireland and, um, and, uh, I said, I need a job pretty quick. And I eventually found one in South Carolina, but South Carolina is not where I wanted to be. I wanted to be in the mountains. Um, and then a job came up in Virginia in the mountains. So I took that one. Um, when you say kicked out, was it visa wearing out that, that kind of thing? What, what was happening? Yeah, sort of. So when I got to Ireland, um, the profession of chiropractic actually wasn't recognized as a profession um, under the Department of Occupations. Um, chiropractors were there, and they were in a they were uh, you know practicing under a self regulating body called the Chiropractic Association of Ireland. Um, but then at some point while I was there, it became a profession. It became recognized as a profession. It was lumped in with professions like uh, medical doctors and nutritionists and and physiotherapists and things like that. Um, and those were occupations that could only be done by European citizens. Oh. And I was not a European citizen. So I went to apply for my third work visa and they said no. And we couldn't figure out why uh, my employer, you know, hired a lawyer. We tried to figure it out and they still said no. So eventually I had to go. Wow. Wow. Yeah. It, it's funny when you deal with municipalities anywhere in the world, they don't really give you answers. Nobody's there. They, they just go, nope. And when you say yeah. why, they go, uh, we just said no. Well, yeah. you need to go figure it out yourself. Yeah. Well, they kept they kept sending us a letter that, you know, highlighted this this one bylaw or something somewhere in some document. And I said, this is why. And it didn't make sense. And we were just like, OK, well, the fact that I've been here two years and have a patient base already, like, doesn't matter um, that I'm not taking a job from anyone because there's not that many chiropractors in Ireland. And they were like, no, it doesn't matter. See you later. Wow. Unbelievable. Um also, you, you know, from the same college, you have a degree, uh, a doctorate in, in chiropractic, but you also um, have a master, a master's in, in uh, nutrition. Mm -hmm. uh, how did those two things come up? What, what were you thinking? Like, it sounds like I'm saying, what were you thinking? But I'm saying, what was the thought pattern? Right? What, what were you thinking coming out of college? What, what did you want to do? Well, coming out of college, you know, 
I, I guess, you know, I'm type one diabetic and I was pretty inspired by my pediatric endocrinologist to be some sort of physician. Um, but I, I quickly lost faith in, in Western medicine uh, when I realized that as a type one, I was never told that anything about my lifestyle I could do differently would affect my ability to manage the condition. So once I figured that out, I was like, well, Western medicine doesn't really seem like what I want to learn. You know, I don't want to learn how to just give medication because that's all I really experienced. Um, and I'd been to chiropractors uh, when I was young. My parents had taken me. Um, and so I thought, well, you know, I'll, I'll become a chiropractic physician. Um, so I did that. And then, you know, as I, I've always been a very curious person. I've always wanted to know the answers, find out why things are happening, you know, find out why I had the health conditions I had when I was a kid. And so always very curious. And I found that even like my medical training, which was, you know, as a chiropractor, um, all the, all the basic science knowledge you get, all the knowledge of the neuromusculoskeletal system and just how the body works, it didn't really fulfill what I was looking for, like why I got sick as a child and, and why the things I changed growing up had an effect on my ability to manage these conditions. And so I was always looking for more. And I thought, well, maybe this master's in nutrition and functional medicine will give me the answers. And so I did that as well. And it gave me more answers along the lines of what I wanted, but it still wasn't what, what I was looking for. And, you know, it wasn't until, you know, I, I started learning about evolution and then just really digging in and looking, like not, not like, not filtering out any type of information, just consuming it all um, and, and, and finding anything I could about health and the body and everything and just getting all these different perspectives and ideas that I really figured out or feel like I figured out, you know, what it takes to become healthy. Um, and especially with heart disease, because as a type one, I'm heavily predisposed to heart disease. So it's always been this constant quest for knowledge for me. I'm constantly reading um, and constantly trying to learn. And I was at first trying to do that in a formal, like academic way and get these degrees. And I realized that I didn't need those. Um, it's good to have that medical background, but I didn't need them to figure out the answers that I needed. Yeah, you know, it's interesting. You mentioned type one and uh, not getting the answers you want. Um, <clears throat> In my first movie, uh, I had this husband and wife, uh, Bethany McKenzie, and her husband, who was a, 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 a surgeon. And, you know, their son River, you know, one night they figure out he's, you know, still, you know, maybe you know, five, six years old. He's losing weight. This is, you know, all kinds of stuff is happening. And they're not, this all started happening overnight, you know, like over, you know, I think they were on some trip or something. And someone was watching the kids or whatever. They came home and found a different kid. They rushed him to the hospital. Turns out he was type one. And um, they start, you know, she becomes the consummate mom. And um, she's trying to do everything right. She's going to, you know, okay, my kids are type one. What do we do? And they're, you know, saying he can eat all of this candy and he could do all of this stuff. And, you know, and she goes, she's constantly chasing insulin with sugar and sugar with insulin, you know, wondering if the kid's going to wake up dead. Yeah, all of the stuff that parents worry about just constantly, right? And then one day, you know, like she, she's just worn out from being up all the time, right? <clears throat> and she goes to the internet and she, she's looking around one night at like two in the morning after the kid had an episode. Mm -hmm. And um, she finds low carb and type one or something to that degree. I'm, I'm paraphrasing the story. And uh, she starts going down this rabbit hole all night long. She stays up and just goes down these rabbit holes. And she goes, well, that, that makes a lot of sense. If I don't give my kid any extra sugar, I'm not chasing it with so much of this fast act, acting insulin, the whole thing. And, you know, she, she was doing this for like a month. Right. And she noticed that she was giving her kid a substantially less amount of insulin. And she, she was like, oh my God, this, this is actually, this is working. What these people are talking about. And this is long before me, you know, I'm one of the early people on the internet that started bringing up mm -hmm. low carb and we were called charlatans and everything else. You know, the word keto did not exist when I started this podcast. Think about that. The term keto did not exist. Right. And She's figuring all this stuff out. And um, she goes into her doctor and she goes, Doc, you're not going to believe this. I've been doing this really low carb, um, kind of this, kind of this uh, Atkins protocol with my kid. 
and he's striving and he's doing better and he's healthier and you know her husband's a doctor and he's checking the kid out at home and she thought the doctor was going to give her a big pat on the back and you know go oh my god you know you're a wonderful parent and the whole thing they tried to call child services on her no way really i'm, I'm not making this up this was in the documentary right yeah yeah she yeah, and yeah, I think was in the documentary this, yeah. in, in, in the first one they they were like you're you're ruining your kid you're, yeah. you're you're giving your kid an eating disorder your kid's going to end up hating you all of this stuff all of this stuff right and she was like she left there crying in a heap calling her husband it's like they wanted to call the cops on me hmm. and you know, this is what they were going through because and, and by the way folks if you ever want to go uh she's got um it's a very small instagram but she's there it's called let me be 83. And uh, it's all about River. By the way, River's in high school now. He's a tennis star. You know, he's an athlete in high school doing really well. And um, this is a kid where they said, nah, you know, just give him all the candy you want, just chase it. And as it turns out, they didn't have to do the fast acting insulin anymore. They were able to just give him the old stuff that's almost free. The old, old style, old school mm -hmm. insulin, right? Mm -hmm. No, nobody likes that. You see, yeah. no one wants that because they can't make money on that. Exactly. Yeah. Well, you can get that stuff for, I think it's like Walmart, you get it for like 10 bucks or something. Yeah. For yeah. like a month's supply. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it's crazy what goes on in, in this world. And, you know, this, it was just a mother who took charge. And by the way, they ended up doing a movie. They have a documentary out there. Um, but yeah, you know, <clears throat> you look at this kind of stuff and you go, what are we doing? Why are we trying to hurt people in the process of trying to heal them? What? And then you start realizing, well, if we don't advocate for ourselves, then who will? Right? Mm -hmm. I mean, you went to college, you got multiple degrees to fix yourself. <laughs> Pretty much. Yeah. So let's, you know, how, how does, so you, you're back here. I want to continue with your story. Mm -hmm. You're back here. What happens? You, you, you end up in the States. How do you get set up uh, with where I am now? So, well, I mean, I guess it was, you know, I guess my whole adult life, I've been interested in, in heart disease. So th this whole time I'm going through, like, and I'm finding these different jobs. Like I come back to the States. I, you know, I found a job, a few different jobs in South Carolina that didn't really fit. And then um, eventually, you know, got this job as an associate chiropractor here in, in Virginia in Roanoke and, and I'm happy here. And the best part about it was, is that um, this job also allows me to, to pursue the other things I want to pursue, not just practice chiropractic, very neuromusculoskeletal, but also um, allows me the time to, you know, research and write uh, like I've been doing uh, since, since I got here. Um, and so the whole of my adult career, I've been, uh, or adult life, I've been kind of paying attention to heart disease because I'm heavily predisposed to it as a type one. And, you know, so, you know, I'm running a, a thriving chiropractic practice. And then just this past April, released the book, Understanding the Heart, because I started sharing the information I'd found um, uh, on social media, maybe four years ago now, mm -hmm. and people seem to like it. Uh, and it was a lot of it's very contrary to what we think about the heart and heart disease. And so eventually decided to put it down in a book. Um, and, and here we are today, um, you know, with this book, the, this new, the, my second book, Understanding the Heart being released in April. And um and, uh, and it's been, it's been fun, but that's the best part is that I love not just being a chiropractor, but being able to actually go and pursue the real answers that I'm looking for. Um, and then, uh, and then relaying that information to other people, um, to try and help them as well. Okay. I, I want to move into a direction because, um, I, I, I read a little bit about you. I, I like, I like what you have to say about the heart. And, you know, in order to understand that you went back to, you went back a bunch of years, you know, it's like, you know, the evolution of the heart, right? And you bring mm. it forward. I want you to talk about that. But first, I need to tell everyone right now, at my company, nsngfoods.com, nsngfoods.com, that's where we have the ultra fat. You guys can go there. And um, it's a one time deal make it a big order because you can get 20% off by putting in promo code Vinny. Even if you have a subscription, you could do a one time go there and you know, you want to get ahead, get a bunch of this stuff. 
I can, I'm making the stuff left and right now. There is no back order. We have everything in stock in ways you couldn't imagine. You can go, you got your kids, you're going to start going to school. You're going to want to put this in the lunch boxes and everything else. Go get your, your ultra fat right now. There's only for people who don't know what it is. It's a product I came up with for athletes, but as it turns out, Parents love to give it to kids, people, uh, people, uh, type ones, take it. Um, uh, kids with epilepsy, take the, you know, you know, people that are on low carb diets for epilepsy. This stuff is being sold all over the place. That's why we can't keep it in stock. It's a very unique product. The one thing everyone looks at and they can't understand whenever I shoot us to nutritionists and dietitians and the whole thing, they go, wow you really made a product that only has four ingredients in it. That's right. I put what? Oh, just nut butter, right? Almond butter, organic. I put coconut oil for that, you know, and you know, medium chain triglyceride. I put my ultra fat in it. So you get a little electrolyte in there. And that so gives it a nice savory flavor. And we put fresh vanilla, four ingredients. That's it. The stuff doesn't have any kind of seed oils. It doesn't have any crap in it. There's no high fructose corn syrup. There's nothing. I manufacture this myself. I, I started a kitchen. I manufacture this stuff myself. This is not being done somewhere else where they're putting crap in it. By the way, in the interest of full disclosure, the one that has the coffee flavor has five ingredients. I literally put my coffee in it. So go check it out, nsngfoods.com, ultra fat. 20% off, even if you have a subscription. By the way, after you get that incredible deal by putting in promo code Vinny, you can get 15% off ongoing by setting up a subscription. So many ways to save at nsngfoods.com. Go check that out. We're talking to Dr. Stephen Hussey, and um, he's written a book, and he talks about the heart from an evolutionary angle. And that's why the guy's on the show. That's what I really want to get to. So Stephen, explain what you mean. Yeah, so the first part of the book, I, I took it way back to, um, you know, I guess the the, the, the Big Bang, you know, the, the dawn of life, or whatever, like what was happening during that time? Because what happened during that time when when the first um, <clears throat> bacteria were there, um, what happened during that time formed things that are still present in us today. Um, one of those things is, is mitochondria, which we all have in our cells. Um, we have tons of them in our cells. Um, so at some point, you know, a, a certain bacteria that was living teamed up with another one. Um, and that other one kind of got engulfed by the one bacteria and the one that got engulfed could utilize oxygen. Uh, it was very good at utilizing oxygen, which was changing in the atmosphere at that time. Uh, oxygen was becoming more prevalent. And so it was kind of like, oh, now the cell doesn't have to worry about, uh, making energy because this other you know, organism that it kind of engulfed into it is doing that for it. And like this, this relationship was formed that kind of has lasted the, the test of time. And so today we have these cells um, that have become multicellular organisms, um, you know, whether that's plants or insects or animals or us or humans um, that have cells with mitochondria in them. And mitochondria are how um, we, or at least in mammals, um, we, um, we take oxygen from the environment, harvest, you know, the energy from you know, chemical bonds and food and make ATP, which is energy um, that our body uses. And the heart has a uh, especially dense concentration of these mitochondria because it's a very energy demanding um, organ because it's always contracting. Um, notice I say not pumping because the heart, in fact, in my opinion, and based on a lot of evidence is not actually a pressure propulsion pump um, that, that moves blood throughout the body. That's not its job. But, um, but the heart is constantly contracting, so it uses a lot of energy. Um, and so we have to understand that kind of stuff, like the formation of these, or the, I guess, the evolution of these mitochondria to understand these heart tissues um, that, um, that can't divide, which they're one of a few cells in the body that can't divide to, um, you know, to grow new tissue. So if we get damaged to the heart, that's why it's a big deal, because they can't divide and make new ones. We have to try and repair the damaged ones. Um, and there's, there's reasons for that. Um, and it has to do with the amount of energy that the heart demands. Um, but we have to talk about the mitochondria. We have to talk about the evolution of the stress response in mammals, because in reptiles, there was a certain type of stress response that 
um, if they get overwhelmed and in a stressful situation, they actually like, kind of play dead. Um, they can actually shut down certain organs um, because they're cold blooded. They have a very slow metabolism. They can do that without dying. Whereas in a mammal, that's impossible. If you have a stress response that, that overwhelms you so much that you shut down, mammals are so warm blooded and metabolically active that if an organ shut down, it would kill them. Um, and so something had to happen to our stress response in order for mammals to evolve from reptiles. And that has um, a particular impact on the heart because the heart is what's uh, interpreting our emotions and communicating that to our body. That's why we say things like, I love you with all my heart. And so how that, that stress response evolved is very, very important. And then um, the third part of evolution to humans that I focus on is, is the idea that I think lots of people on your show will probably be familiar with is that this idea that saturated fat causes heart disease, which is totally untrue um, mm -hmm. because saturated fat and animal foods are the diet that humans literally evolved eating uh, to become what we are today. Um, so there's that. And then, you know, it was, it was that type of diet all the way, you know, up until, you know, almost less than a hundred years ago when things went really wrong. And we all know the story there with, with your documentaries and things like that. But I took it all the way back to try and get people to understand that we have to pay attention to these things because they are evolved mechanisms in the body that have been there for literally millions of years, billions of years in some cases. And so to defy that kind of stuff and live in a way that doesn't create health in those things is, is a mistake. And it's a big reason why we have disease in general, but specifically in my book, I talk heart disease. Steven, I want you to go back a little bit because um, we gained a big audience this year alone. And a lot of people have never seen fat a documentary. A lot of people have never seen fat a documentary too. Uh, most of my new listeners have seen the third movie. As a matter of fact, I, I get phone calls, you know, people, I do these phone calls every day and people go, man, I love your movie. And I'll go, well, which one? And they'll go, well, you know, Beyond Impossible. And I'll go, you, you realize I've done two before that. And they're like, oh, my God, I had no idea. Because uh, I was on um, the Mike Rowe podcast, and it's one of the larger podcasts in the world. And um, and I, I picked up a substantial, you know, my audience was about a million, million, one, million, two downloads a month. And now it's picked up substantially from there. So we have a couple hundred thousand more people listening to this than we had before. And when you say, well, well, people know from your movie that everything changed about 100 years ago. Actually, it was more like 160 years ago now when you think about it, because we're talking about the 1860s when, you know, the Seventh-day Adventist Church had a crazy woman and it named Ellen G. White. And um, she she had a premonition. God came to her in, in the night. And... Um, Look, I don't know if God came to her or not. I'm, I'm an atheist. I don't know much about God, you know, and, but okay. But if someone said, hey, God came to you in the night, I would have questions. What, what did he have to say? What did he look like? Did he have the white robe on? You know, I, I want to know stuff. Did he have the big, long beard? Um, but they said, what did God say? Usually, like, if, if you said today, God came to me last night, you, you're family would start calling hospitals. We need, he's delusional. We need to get him in. But back then, eh, what did God have to say? Well, God told me that we shouldn't eat anything with a face. That's what God told Ellen G. White. And so formed modern day or the beginnings of modern day veganism, right? Um, but veganism couldn't really take hold back then. They had a big problem. Because if you did, tried not to eat meat, you couldn't get all the vitamins and nutrients you needed to actually sustain the normal life, right? And you got to remember, in the 1860s, yeah, electricity wasn't a thing. We didn't have, you know, you got really cold in the winter. You got really hot in the summer. You, you know, there was disease. There was all this stuff. You could not afford not to get all the vitamins and minerals you can possibly get from food, or you would die. This is a time when people would die of a broken leg. I'm not kidding, folks. You broke your leg back then. Good possibility you were going to die. People don't get that today. Falling downstairs was a problem back then. Still a problem today, but you know what I mean. So we have that situation going on. And the only reason modern day veganism can 
actually people can survive is because you could take exogenous vitamins. You know, we've, we've identified the 13 essentials. We've identified a lot of other stuff and on and on and on, what have you. Right. So, but I want you to explain, I want you to take it from there and go before 1865 and maybe talk a little bit about how humans ate, because look, now, let me just add this and then I'll let you take over. The average American eats around 300 pounds of sugar per person per year. In 1860, the average person got less than a pound of sugar per year. That's a big difference, right? And from what I can tell, we didn't have heart disease back then. But I'm going to let you take over from there. What, what were people eating before that? What, are, what did the diet look like, maybe in this country, maybe in Europe? Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, you're right, actually, about heart disease not being around because the field of cardiology actually really wasn't a thing in the early 1900s. There just wasn't that much heart disease uh, going around. They didn't need a field of cardiology. They didn't need cardiologists. There were some you know, people who were interested in the heart who decided to do that. But yeah, the field of cardiology is relatively new as well, just as new as heart disease is. Um, well, you know, I mean... In the book, I talk about it evolutionarily, like when, you know, what, uh, what happened that made humans what they are today. Uh, like when the first modern humans appeared, you know, around 300,000, 250,000 years ago, um, what were they eating? What, what led them to that? Um, and it's interesting if you look at like the work of Mickey Bendor and he talks about like the, 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 the size of mammals um, before that time. And, you know, the, the size of mammals was like when the time like the dinosaurs died off um the si average size of mammals was like no more than the size of a field mouse and um, they were really small but then the dinosaurs died off and that kind of paved the way for mammals um and they became huge they got ginormous like i think the um we're talking about like woolly mammoths and giant cave bears like the average size grew substantially and then about 2.5 million years ago uh when humans started hunting um that happened around the same time um, I guess it wasn't humans. It was Australopithecus at that time, uh, like pre pre humans. Um, uh, we see this die off, this big die off, and it could have been a lot of things. It could have been, you know, changes in environment. It could have been um, uh, uh, drastic shifts and or like you know natural disasters and things like that create this die off. But humans were also hunting because we also see, you know, modern humans start to evolve. We start to see that that the pre humans uh, grew a lot bigger in stature. Their brains grew a lot bigger. Um, and then somewhere along the way, I think like, I think I might be wrong on the day, like one and a half million years ago, um, fire was invented. So we had these humans that were at first scavengers scavenging these, the carcasses of, of what the other predators were eating. So we were getting at the bone marrow and the brain and things like that. Um, and then eventually we started hunting. Um, and then, so we're, we're evolving for this direct absorption of nutrients from animal foods. Uh, our, our digestive systems are away from this fermentation like we see in our closest relatives like the chimps and the gorillas and things like that um, away from a gut that ferments and more toward this direct absorption and high stomach acid and then all of a sudden we found fire we we harnessed fire so now we were not only designed to uh, or evolved to um, um, direct absorption of nutrients we cooked it first the animal foods first which made it even more able to be absorbed because break down of those cell walls in a more absorption of nutrients. And then we just shot up where our stature exploded, brains grew tremendously. And we have, you know, we have the Neanderthals and then we also have modern humans. And so, and then humans were eating that for a very, very long time. It was, it was the main part of a uh, uh, human's diet for a very, very long time until maybe 10,000 years ago or so when we, when humans um, started, uh, I guess, farming. Um, modern, modern agriculture was invented. Um, and there's lots of reasons why they think this was. Um, they thought that humans may have found that they could stay in one place and you know farm and not have to be nomadic and follow the herds and things like that. However, livestock was still a huge part of, of that civilization, which was what was born out of the, the, the um, farming. And also a class system formed, uh, currency formed, all these things that were uh, that you were used to unfortunately control human populations because if you control the food, you control the people. Um, and so, but during all that time, animal foods were still a big part of the human diet. 
And like you said, it wasn't until all the way up until the 1860s when this idea that you shouldn't eat animal foods came about. And at first you're saying, like you were saying, it's in, it was really hard because you needed all the nutrients you need. And I'll add to what you were saying is that at that time too, it would have been impossible to do that because you can't get all the food you need. You can't even get all the food you need, even if you could ship foods from all over the world. Um, you can't get all the nutrients you need, um, but it was even more impossible then. It's only possible today um, because people can supplement and because food can be shipped from all over the world, which is incredibly unsustainable. Um, you know, if I look at a cow or animal food, it can, uh, it can live pretty much anywhere. You, can, you don't have to ship that anywhere. You have that right in your backyard for the right. most part. And uh, so that seems incredibly sustainable to me as far as a transportation kind of thing. But so when we, when, we, when we zoom out and we look at that huge history of humans, it makes absolutely no sense that saturated fat animal foods are causing disease um, because that's literally the diet. That, I mean, there, there are studies that show that Neanderthals and the first modern humans ate almost 100% animal foods. When you look at the, um, when you break down the, um, the nitrogen in the, in the bones and they're, they're almost, uh, they're level with other carnival known carnivores at that time, as far as like how many, what they ate. Um, and it was, we were like the, definitely the dominant predator of the time and, you know, plant foods were, um, survival foods, like in times of survival, we, we, we retain the ability to eat those foods. Um, so that we could survive in times of scarcity, um, but right. which was a, a huge evolutionary advantage to us, which is why we still retain that today. But think about it like this. I, I, I read a great analogy, like, let's say, um, you know, the, the main diet of this animal was pudding. Okay. However, one month out of the year, it had to survive on rocks uh, because there was no pudding available. You better maintain the ability to digest and break down those rocks even if it's not your ideal diet, because you have to survive that one month out of the year. Um, does that make sense? Right. No, look, it, thing. Makes, it, it makes total sense. Um, where I lived in California, there were just a ton of coyotes. And at certain times of years when, uh, of the year, when there was a lot of rabbit breeding, they had a lot of food. And whenever you would see coyote poop on the trail, you could tell it was from meat and you would see fur in it. You know, from, mm. from the, the rabbits, they, you know, they, they just feasted on rabbits. And when you saw the coyotes at that time of year, they were very robust and healthy looking. They, they almost looked as nice as, as, as a, a German shepherd, if you will. You know, just nice and muscled up. But then there were certain parts of the summer when the rabbits wouldn't breed and it wouldn't be a lot. You wouldn't see a lot of rabbits running around in the hills around my house. I did a lot of hiking and bike riding. So a lot of observation, right? And um, you would see where the coyotes were just trying to fill up their stomach. And they would, you, you would see a lot of seeds and a lot of, you know, just bulbs from different, you know, mm -hmm. different plants in their poop. And that was all, that's all you saw. It was just that, right? They were just trying to fill up their stomach. And when you saw them running around, they looked horrible. You, you, you felt like shooting them to put them out of their misery, but they would regroup whenever there was more rabbits to eat. Right now, I'm not comparing a human to but to but I'm comparing it to this idea of when you have to keep your stomach full, you have to keep it full. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, yeah. Yeah. I, I don't know how I got into that other than the fact that, that you know, that's that's just an observation you make now other observations. Right. You look, and this is horrible, but we've seen it happen too many times in recent times where these zealot vegan parents, you know, let's call them ignorant because, you know, they, they, they went along with the whole vegan thing and decided they weren't going to eat anything with a face. And that's fine. <clears throat> Most vegans figure it out. 80 something percent go away from veganism in the first six months. They figure out, oh, my God, this is not healthy. Mm -hmm. Right. But sometimes they have kids. And from infant, they're trying to feed these kids this stupid fucking vegan diet. And the babies die. We, we've seen this in recent time, not once, not twice. I wish we'd only seen it once. And you would think that the rest of these idiots would learn. But they don't. We see it over and over and over again. 
right? Mm-hmm. So we can call that an N1 experiment, right? Because it's not big enough to do an epidemiological study. There's not enough people stupid enough to do that. But we do see it. And it's sad. It's very sad. I, I, I wept openly the last time I saw this case. It, it wasn't that long ago, and I was watching. I was looking at it on the internet. I, I wept openly. I, I was like, "How th- this kid's? It would have been nicer if someone would have put a bullet in this infant's head. Mm-hmm. It would have died instantly. This, this, this poor infant starved, starved, mm-hmm. and it didn't have to." Because the parents were ignorant. Now, you look and at the, the worst on. part about it is is lots of times people will see that in the news or, or they won't see it in the news because it doesn't you know match the agenda that one they want to put out there. But if they do see it, lots of times they'll say, "Oh, well, they must not have done it right. They must not have done a vegan diet right." You know, right. instead of saying, "Oh, maybe I should look into this, see if if my child too is is malnourished or whatever." Like every parent, not just parents who are trying to raise vegan kids, but every parent's like, "Oh, I should really pay attention to." that what I'm feeding my child to make sure they're nutritionally adequate. Um, but yeah, lots of times it's just like, Oh, they must not have done it right. I mean, I heard that all the time. Um, when I tell people, um, you know, about vegans who, who, you know, went away from veganism after a while, they say, Oh, they must not have done it right. It's like, well, no, there's just no way to do it. Right. Yeah. There is no way to, you know, look, as I always say, it's the only eating disorder where you get a pass Mm. or you're vegan. It's an eating disorder. I'm sorry, but but they give you a pass because you. It sounds cool. The other side of it is when you listen to people like Michael Greger. He calls himself Doctor Michael Greger, but he never got a degree. But that's not the only thing he's lying about. <laughs> but Michael Greger says that <clears throat> if you eat even one egg a week, one egg, one per week, it's enough to cause type two diabetes. Type two. Um. I had nine eggs today. (laughs) I had seven or eight yesterday. I probably eat several dozen eggs every week. Why are my A1Cs at (laughs) 4.5? Why am I not getting type 2 diabetes? Michael Greger and also Clapper and uh, all of them. They'll, you know, um, Esselstein, they'll say that if you eat animal protein, meat, fish, eggs, what have you milk. It builds up pus in your body. Now, I I eat red meat every day. Don't laugh. Don't don't you laugh at me, Dr. Hussey. <laughs> I I have dairy every day. I have eggs every day. I have red meat every day. I have fish most days or some days, and I have chicken some days. You're a doctor, you have advanced degrees, where's this pus? Where should I be seeing it? Is it like in my stomach? Is it in my feet? I I need to know where all this pus is. I want to know the mechanisms that they say that 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 happens. I I want to know the mechanisms that they they say that those foods cause pus. I've invited them to be in my movie, my third movie. Yeah. Have you seen my third movie, by the way? Not yet. Oh, you need to see Beyond Impossible because I literally invited all the the top vegan doctors, mm-hmm. all, all the top guys. None of them could make it to do a Zoom video to be in my movie. Oh, I, I, not I one of imagine them. not. <laughs> and by the way, just so the audience doesn't think I was making that up, I put their rejection letters back to me on the screen. Hmm. They're on the screen. I put them all up. Not all of them. I picked about five or six of them. I couldn't do them all because I was looking for one vegan doctor just to come in and just, you know, I I wanted an honest discussion, but they couldn't do it. They couldn't do it. Of course not. Couldn't be done. Uh, What say you? Um, I say that, I say that these people have built a career around this ideology of a vegan diet and and to to contradict it um, would sacrifice their career and their livelihood, um, and also they convinced they've convinced themselves that it that it is actually healthier. And I think I think that you know influencers of this nature are are victims of epidemiology. 
um, which is a, a type of research that's very low on the research totem pole. It's the lowest actually, because it can't prove that anything causes anything. All it can show is associations. And they're also victims of, I think, nutritionism. Um, and I think that humans sometimes because of our big brains think we're smarter than nature and we can, we can isolate nutrients and we can see what they individually do for us. And we're not respecting the wisdom of, you know, literally millions of years of food consumption. Um, and that is that whole animal foods were what humans were eating for millions of years. Um, and, and instead of breaking things down into all these little parts and saying that, you know, um, oh, this doesn't have this vitamin or this mineral or whatever. It's just like, let's just step back and, and, and respect nature and say like, this is what, this is what gives us nutrients. And there's things about our metabolism and our digestion that we're never going to understand. Um, and in my book, I talk about that, like how we have to, we have to step back and realize that we're probably never going to fully understand all the intricacies of this complex biological ecosystem that is the human body. And instead we need to step back and, and respect whatever it is. What do you think it's nature? What do you think it's God? Whatever, whatever you think it is and say, you know, let, let's, let's just do what we've been doing for millions of years because it's worked. We've gotten to where we are today and stop overthinking it. And I think that's what a lot of people do. And unfortunately we live in a capitalist society. And, you know, if you, if you have this ideology that makes you a lot of money, you're very hesitant to entertain the other side um, or to even listen to it um, because, because, you know, that's your livelihood. So that's yeah. how we got where we are. I want to spend the rest of our time talking about your book. Um, so I have a few questions about it. And um, we're going to send people to it in just a minute. But first, I want to tell everyone about Villa Capelli olive oil. I bet you, uh, Dr. Hussey over there would um, tell you olive oil is a good thing. It can oh, yeah. be that. It, look, it's the one fruit juice I agree with. As long as it's pure olive oil. Yeah, pure olive oil. And by the way, thank you for saying that, Stephen, because um, Villa Capelli, I used to go to Italy and I go there with Serena and I would go, Oh, you know, am I just being romanticized by Italy? Does the oil just taste better here because I'm being romanticized. I'm Italian. Maybe I'm, I'm just thinking this maybe, it, but the oils there, I found myself seeking out oils. Right. And Serena, you know, we, we started Serena speaks fluent Italian, just like everything else she does. Perfect. And she, we started saying, hey, what's with this olive oil? And it's like, because it didn't taste like what we get in the States. And they would all jokingly go, oh, we, we, we ship you guys Lampante. That's Italian for lamp oil. We, we send you guys crap. But then when we learned of Villa Capelli and Paul Capelli, and Paul Capelli explained to us, and we thought he was just selling us. Paul Capelli explained to us that in America, you could cut olive oil up to 40% and still call it 100% pure olive oil. It's, it's cut with seed oils. And then in order to make it look like olive oil, they have to add a color back in. And they also have to put a, a, an aroma, a, a, a perfume in it to make it smell like olive oil. And the label says 100% pure olive oil. Ta-da, welcome to America. I thought Paul was kidding about this. Um, I read a book called Extra Virginity. I read another book uh, by this other. Turns out this is the truth. This is what goes on in America. They allow these companies to cut the oil up to the 40% and still call it 100% pure olive oil. Not at Villa Capelli. Paul Capelli is long gone. Guy passed away a couple of years ago. I rest his soul. Good, great guy. His husband Stephen Crutchfield kept the country going, country, kept a company going in Italy and that country. And we are still getting it here in the United States. Folks, Villa Capelli, best olive oil on the planet. You could go to villacapelli.com or you could go to vinnytauteries.com and click through the banner. When you get to checkout, put in promo code Vinny, V I N N I E, for what? Oh, just 10% off. <clears throat> if you spend more than $100 after the discount code, you will also get free shipping. So it's two ways to save. I actually say three ways. If you get that three liter 10, you're getting more olive oil. When you buy in bulk, it's cheaper anyway. So get the, get the big three liter 10, get some herbs, get everything else, get it to about $115, $120. Come on, let's take them for a ride. Then you get your 10% off and free shipping. So three ways to save at Villa Capelli. We're talking to Dr. Stephen Hussey. He's written a great book. Um, Stephen, 
first thing I want to say, because people are going to hear this, and I wanted to put your book in my book club at vinnytauteries.com, but I went to Amazon, and you had a message up there that said, hey, guys, just a little hold on this book, mm. because I'm with a publisher now. We're going to re-release it. I get it, because I live in that world, right? I know what you're doing, and I think it's a great idea. Can your book be bought now? How, yes. how does that work? Yeah. So if it, so, it was originally a self-published book, and I got picked up by a publisher, and it, it has been republished to the publisher, and that came out April seventh. So make sure if you find uh, Understanding the Heart online, and it's a red cover. That's the wrong book. Um, that's the self-published one that's still up there. That's I had to take down, and now the 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 or I guess the the beige-looking whitish cover. The one that I gave that's you. That's the one I have. Yeah. Yeah. Understanding the heart. Um, that's the one from from republished to the publisher. That's available ebook, audiobook on Amazon, Barnes and Noble, wherever. Yeah. Okay. So I just wanted to be clear about that. So um, that's the one I'll have them put in my book club at vinnytoners.com. Um, look, I get it when it comes to books. Um, mm -hmm. I self published my book uh, just over about, about 10 years ago now. I got very lucky because, well, I didn't get lucky. I did a lot of research. And when my book came out, I had it edited by a proper editor. Mm. Um, I had it formatted for every which way you could format a book. And uh, I also did the audio book right up front with everything else. And um, it became an, a, an instant bestseller. I got lucky um, because I had it in every format, including on Audible. And it was up for all I'm bragging now it was up for audible book of the year. But I tell people all the time, that cost me 15 $16,000 up front, not knowing if I was going to ever sell a copy. So I get what you did, you put a book out there, it did well, boom, get someone else to pick up the bill, and you can still make a dime. Right? Exactly. Yeah. And and have a team working with me to market it rather than just me. Yeah. And well, that's why I started this podcast. I tell everyone, I wasn't being virtuous. I was just trying to sell a book. Yeah. And everyone started glomming onto the show. So here I am doing this podcast 10 years later. Um, what will people learn when they get the book? Get, get, what are appetites? Yeah. So as we talked a little bit about, you know, I talk about like the evolution of, or taking people through the evolution of, to humans and how that's relevant to heart disease. And then in part two, I talk about a lot of um, misconceptions uh, about heart disease. One, I talk about how the heart is not the main mover of the blood in the body and how we've misunderstood what the actual role of the heart uh, in the body is and what actually moves the blood. Um, I talk about um, what really causes atherosclerosis. And I talk about how the formation of structured water in the lining of the arteries is actually what protects the arteries um, from anything. Uh, and, uh, and integrity of that is really important for preventing, preventing atherosclerosis. I talk about how heart attacks can happen without a blockage because that's way more common than we think. Um, where there's absolutely no clot or stenosis present, yet we get tissue death of the heart. Um, I talk about why the heart doesn't get cancer, uh, and it has to do with metabolism and um, and um, and the structure of water of the cells in the heart. And um, and then in the in the third part of the book, I talk about more practical things. You know, like what should we be doing? What should we be eating? How should we reduce oxidative stress? How should we manage or balance our autonomic nervous system, which is our stress response? I talk about chiropractic and heart health. I talk about dental, um, uh, dental health, or the health of the mouth and heart health. I talk about aspirin and why that's recommended, uh, why if it should or should be recommended for prevention. And then I talk about biometrics and what we should be tracking for heart health. Um, and so a lot of the things that I've found are just are directly contrary to what you know we generally think about heart disease and what you'll be told by the average cardiologist. Um, and you know, I'm a chiropractor. I'm not a, I'm not a cardiologist, but I've been looking into this for a very long time. I have a personal connection to it and, uh, and I'm just sharing information and, uh, and I hope that it helps people. Oh, look, a lot of people that I highly respect, um, uh, uh, people like Ivor Cummins, we've become close mm -hmm. friends, Irish, I think. Um, and, um, uh, uh Dave Feldman, the, these guys are doing research that doctors are now looking at because they felt like they got it wrong for all those years. Um, so yeah, you know, it, you know, I respect guys who are out there learning this stuff. Just, I, I want you to wet the whistle of, of, of everyone that's going to read this book just a bit more. You, you mentioned a lot of things there. And you said at the end of the book, you talk about oxidative stress. 
Mm. There's a couple of ways that you can reduce oxidative stress. So oxidative stress is basically when we have too many of what are called free radicals in the body. These are, these are molecules with an unpaired electron and they really, really want to be paired and they're going to get a pair, get another electron in any way possible. I call them like to my patients, I call them the, uh, the Looney Tunes Tasmanian devil. They're going around like crazy trying to find that pair and they're going they're to cause damage. off of everything trying to figure out. Yeah. The and they're going to cause damage in the process of becoming quote unquote stable. Um, and so these, these free radicals are made in the process of us burning energy just naturally, but we're supposed to have internal antioxidants that take care of them right away. But if we're burning the wrong fuel source, like glucose too much, um, we can get an overabundance of them and we're not making enough internal antioxidants, which has to do with getting the right types of proteins, um, collagen proteins, things like that. Um, then, uh, we can get this in balance and that causes oxidative stress. Now, the reason that's a big deal for the arteries is because like I mentioned, water has the ability to hold energy and the blood is half water. And when water holds enough energy, um, it structures itself into what's called fourth phase water. And this is stuff coming out of the lab of Dr. Gerald Pollack at University of Washington. And that lines the arteries and forms this protective layer. Um, and, and so because of the way that it forms, because of the way the water molecule splits and it forms the structured water, which is more like a gel, the structured water is a very electronegative space. It has a lot of electrons to donate. And so when we get high oxidative stress, it can damage that fourth phase water that's protecting the lining of the artery. And then if it damages it enough, that can get to the endothelia and then damages that. Okay. So we don't want that to happen because when that damage happens, then the body has to do something because if it lets that damage go, the artery could rupture. And that's way worse than having a hardening of the artery. And so what it does is it takes cholesterol and minerals and things like that. And, and basically uses that as like spackle pretty much to kind of patch up that inflammation. Um, and so what we need to do is we need to reduce oxidative stress so that that doesn't happen. And we need to build up that fourth phase water lining the artery. And so the way we do that is to build up the fourth phase water, we expose our body to radiant energy. So this could be, I mean, the, the original source of infrared radiant energy is the sun. It's 40% of the rays are infrared grounding, um, having your feet in direct contact with earth. You'll absorb electrons from that. Um, just being around positive people, eating fresh food, um, uh, that kind of stuff. Uh, all those things are, are putting energy into your body so that that water can structure itself. Um, but then reducing oxidative stress, um, big ways to do this first eat an anti-inflammatory diet, eat a diet that's not going to perpetuate oxidative stress. So that's getting rid of vegetable oils, grains, sugars, all those things that are going to cause, um, uh, more metabolism of glucose, uh, breaking metabolism, cause insulin resistance. That's going to cause more oxidative stress. Um, avoidance of toxins, everything from plastics to heavy metals, um, which are pervasive in our, uh, environments and our food supply, um, not having high blood sugar, which the diet is going to help with as well, because when you have high blood sugar, you get damage to red blood cells, you get damaged to tissues in the body, um, from glycation, which is saturation of glucose that can cause oxidative stress. Um, the seed oils, like I mentioned, are, um, not just break your metabolism, but they also are easily oxidized themselves, um, which becomes a free radical becomes damaged. Um, and so that's going to contribute to that as well. Um, let's see endotoxemia. Um, so endotoxemia is when we have poor dental health or we have leaky gut and that bacteria that's supposed to be in our digestive tract gets leaks into our bloodstream. And then the body attacks that bacteria and it releases endotoxins when it does that, which is releases a ton of, of free radicals. Um, and there are so many studies out there showing that endotoxemia um, causes oxidative stress, damages the arteries, that kind of stuff. So making sure your mouth is healthy, making sure your gut is healthy. Um, yeah, that's, those, are, those are some of the big ones um, as far as what's causing oxidative stress, what we can do looking into our life to change to reduce oxidative stress. Well, look, no, that's a, that's a mouthful. And folks, he's got a whole book of this. As a matter of fact, I can't wait to start diving into your book. Um, we we only met a couple of weeks ago, and you know, I wanted to do some reading on it, but I've been back doing podcasts. I'm I'm traveling again this weekend. Uh, I'm gonna, where are you going? Same place you're going. Oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> Momentum in the mountain. Yep, I'll be there. Oh, all right, so I'm going to see you tomorrow. Yeah, right? yeah, we'll see you tomorrow night. So, folks, when you hear this, this is coming out in like two or three weeks. <laughs>
Are you talking? Are you talking at the event? No, I've spoken for them before. Um, I'm just coming to be a previous speaker and, and mingle. So, oh, so, you know, I, I don't know if you know this about me, but I don't prepare anything before I go on stage. <laughs> I don't to be. I, because people go, wow, you, you know, you, you, you have that down so pat. And I'm like, yeah, because I'm not trying to remember what I'm going to say because mm. I'm making it up as I go. Mm. You know, I have years and years of one bit of knowledge and I just, um, how, what, what's it like? Is it indoors, outdoors? What's the scene? Where am I going to be talking? Indoors. Yeah. The, the little event center they have. Um, and then I think, uh, I think like the, the, the after afterwards social stuff is going to be outside, but I, I'm okay. Not sure. And how, how big is the audience? Oh, I don't know. Uh, it depends. This is their big event for the year. So, um, I don't know when I spoke, I was, a, I was just a smaller one. I was just a one speaker kind of thing. It was probably like, 25 people there right so and this is the big event so I, i'm hoping they i hoping they draw one or 200 or something like that cool so it's still pretty intimate right yeah yeah no, like, good. Like, sometimes i speak at these um conventions and there's like seven eight hundred people in the room yeah you know and um but this is more of an intimate event yeah good. So i'm just gonna hang out and talk for a bit because right. when, it's, when it's small like that I like to open the floor to questions way early because mm -hmm. I hate talking at people. I like talking with people, you know, kind of like this conversation we had. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's good. Cool. Um, when I went up there to speak for him, it, it was good. I like the, I like the smaller crowd sometimes because yeah, the questions are very good. People are more bold, more bold to, to ask them. And so uh, that's the that's where people learn the most. Yeah. Um, Summers and what's his name? Steve. Is Steve. Steve. Steven Steve. Summers. And, uh, I, you know, when um, I, I don't know who who it was that called me and said, hey, would you do this? Would you talk to these people? I planned on just telling them I couldn't make it. Mm -hmm. I, I'm, I'm being honest. This is still all on. on this is going to be in the show. They're going to hear it. Yeah, I was just going to. They they were so positive and so infectious that I was like, holy shit, because I've been on the road, man. I've been mm -hmm. on the road for like three weeks. Mm hmm like rock star style, just driving from thing to thing. And I'm just back home and I'm going again because I, these people were just positive and infectious. And I'm like, Oh my God, I, I can't not go do this. Yeah, no, I love them. Um, I, and I live close enough to them. Um, I try and get up there and see them, but uh, yeah, they're great people. And you know, they're, they're doing a good thing for a community. Cause you know, I don't know. Um, it's, it's great, you know, like to get this information out in the cities, people are paying attention to information, but like they're in a really rural area. Yeah. So to bring this information to them there is I think a really, really good thing. And I'm glad that they're, they're spending their time doing that. Yeah. By the way, folks, um, you won't be able to go because we're recording this on the 28th and I'm talking <laughs> on the 30th. It's called momentum in the mountain. <laughs> and um, I'm looking forward to going. Um, and I, I think some old friends are going to be like Amy. Um, yeah. Um, uh, Berger and some of these people are going to be there. And uh, yeah, Philip Aveda is going to be there. Do you know Phil? Yeah, I've been on his podcast. Yeah. Uh, Wait, no, I've been on this podcast. He, he, uh, <laughs> he really enjoyed my book, which I was quite impressed with because he's a, he's a cardiothoracic surgeon. So, no, look, if, if Philip signs off on you, you're the real deal. <laughs> nice. So, um, I, I want to say this to you on mic. Uh, you are invited back anytime. I, I thoroughly enjoyed uh, your well studied, you, you know, your, you know, your, your business and uh, thank you for coming on. Um, really appreciate it. Folks, uh, hang on. I want to say goodbye to you off the air, Steve. Uh, folks, if you like what's going on here, you know, I keep this podcast free. Um, and uh, the way we keep it free is I just beg you guys, before you go to Amazon, go to vinnytotaries.com, click through the banner. It puts a little coal on the fire, gets my train down the track and I'm able to keep the show free for well over 10 years. If you don't shop on Amazon, or if you have a couple of extra bucks, we have a super fan page at vinnytotteries.com. I literally see every morning the names of the people who give, and I'm thanking you guys right now. Thank you for giving. It's how people find this show. Uh, I don't get any money from it. I do it for free. I do five shows a week. Thank you guys for giving. Um, it helps pay for everyone who works here. The book is called, um, Stephen, give me the name of the book. It's Understanding the Heart. Oh, yeah, that's a really tough title. 
<laughs> Understanding the Heart by Dr. Stephen Hussey, H-U-S-S-E-Y. It will be in my book club, so go check it out there. On, on behalf of Dr. Hussey, my name is Vinny Totterich. Put life into living and do it with enthusiasm. <laughs>